Have you ever wanted to own a piece of Disneyland? How about something even better? How about something from the personal collection of the people who built Disneyland? How about concept artwork that helped them create the rides and attractions that millions of people love? Well, then you have to come to a place like this, Heritage Auctions here in Beverly Hills. They are having a huge, massive auction with artwork from the people that created Disneyland, with props from the theme parks themselves. There's some legendary stuff in there. Let's not waste any more time outside let's get inside because we're going to get a very private tour of this epic collection all right we are inside of heritage auctions in beverly hills i'm standing here with corey brooks who is kind of running the show in here for us tonight corey what the heck is going on well we have an exhibit set up currently that is a mixture of disney theme park and items from the collection of mark and alice davis mark and alice are both disney legends in their own right Mark is known for his contributions to the Disney studio, as well as his contributions to the Disney theme park. Right, so animation and theme yeah, park Yeah, whether you're a designing. fan of the Disney studios or of the Disney theme parks, Mark's oh. your guy. Okay, and Alice Davis, his wife, was a costume designer. Yeah. Alice Davis, she did costuming for It's a Small World, for Pirates of the Caribbean, <sighs> and again, she's a Disney legend in her own right. And so well. it's their estate. They got the whole collection in here. Yeah, so half of this collection is directly from the uh, Mark and Alice Davis archives, and the other half is brought in from multiple multiple consigners. You see things from the Disney theme parks, you see things from the Disneyland Hotel, and <sighs> other artifacts here. And we can't ignore Mickey, so like this piece right here, the first thing we see, what is this from? This is a massive Disney store display of Sorcerer Mickey. You know, the Disney store is so popular in the 1990s and early 2000s. It was one of the only times you can go and see life-size or sometimes larger than life-size of your Dis favorite Disney characters. I mean, you can see things like Sorcerer Mickey. You can <sighs> see behind you some of the characters from Alice oh, in Wonderland. Yeah. I loved those stores because when you went in there, they were all themed out. They were epic. Well, they were imagine full being of all a child props. and you see your favorite Disney character peering down at you or in an actual scene or an environment. I mean, they really brought those characters to life at the Disney yeah. stores. Yeah. So this is just the beginning. Okay, what, what did we just pass up though? We just passed up something epic. And by the way, we got fake Tyler behind the camera. How are you doing, Tyler? I'm doing well. Thanks. Tyler's doing really well. What is this? Now, I yeah. thought this might just be a piece of merchandise or prop. Right. This, this is one of the highlights of the auction. Uh, it's a functioning audio animatronic Tiki Room Tiki Bird. And this is from the Tiki Room? Yeah, this is from the Tiki Room at Walt Disney World. Uh, the bird itself is all original. The components inside, the pneumatic components are all original. The display was custom built, but if you actually push that button back there, you'll see it operate. Okay. Oh my gosh. Look at the Tiki Room bird. It's freaking singing the song. So that was incredible. It sings, it dances, it moves. So somebody created the base and then rewired exactly. it and set so it all up. This is as close as you can get to having a piece of the actual tiki room in your house. I couldn't believe you pushed the thing and it still, it clicks still moves. and clacks yeah, and still works. still clicks and clacks, does the background audio. So that's from Florida over here, mm -hmm. but I can see there's so many pieces of things. This is gonna be a difficult yeah. job, everybody, because there's so much stuff in here. There's we over 1,800 even... items in this collection. You're kidding yeah. me. Okay, never, so what ends. have we got over here? I guess we should start at the beginning and work our way down. We have the Disney Store pieces. Sure. Well, what's the big card from this Alice in Wonderland thing? So yeah, you'll recognize that uh, Painting the Flowers Red card from Alice yeah. in Wonderland. This was actually used on Sleeping Beauty Castle at Disneyland. I think it was the 50th anniversary. They were doing a refurbishment for the, for the anniversary year. And these larger than life playing cards decorated the castle. And you can see there were several of them up there painting the castle. And so, so when they were, turning it all gold and getting ready for the big celebration. This was sort of like an interim kind of entertaining thing. But what about this giant Alice in Wonderland yeah, statue? Alice. So this Alice was a one of a kind Disney store also figure. That was it in looks the bronze, Disney's is it real? It looks bronze, but I believe it's actually fiberglass. But they did such an expert job painting it that it does look very convincingly bronze. But this was one of the displays in the New York Disney store. That is incredible. And then I'm assuming these are these just come with it? These are like these, It's a pieces. separate lot. These are. Uh, garden statues based on the characters of Alice in Wonderland. So there's a mix in here of stuff from the theme parks, we have stuff from Disney Store, merchandise, concept Correct. artwork, we've got all kinds of Yeah, if you're stuff. into props or collectibles, there's something for everyone. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm very costuming. into props and collectibles. But and yeah, some, costuming. Some even like the full costuming. This is a walk around character costume of Alice uh, from Disneyland. So this is used in the park? Used by a walk around character in the park for Alice, yes. No way. In what era, roughly? Uh, circa 1990s. Really? So this is like my childhood Alice. I could have taken a picture with this very... Exactly. Countless people probably posed with this exact no costume character. No way. That's amazing. Now, I'm assuming 
because Heritage Auctions is what, you tell me a little bit about Heritage Auctions. Sure. I know very little. Heritage Auctions, we're based out of Dallas. We have offices in Beverly Hills, where we are right now, Chicago, New York, and we're the largest collectibles auction house in the world. That's what I was going to yeah. say. I wanted to make sure that yes. was actually the fact. Largest so in the world. it's a big company. It's a big, very professional very much organization. So. And we do animation auctions, things like Disney theme park. We do sports, entertainment memorabilia. You name it. If it's a collectible, Heritage sells it. So something like this, when somebody brings something like this to auction, mm -hmm. it's it's usually kind of private. Yes. You don't. So I my instinct is always go, where did you get this from? <laughs> but that's not. So every item in the sale comes on consignment. So it right. comes from somebody. And sometimes those are people that work at the theme park or their grandparents work there. Ooh. We have items like from the Mark and Alice collection we'll get to soon uh, that come directly from Mark and Alice. And when we can share those stories, we do. Right. Other times people prefer to be a little private and that's fine. Okay. But, uh, everything so I'll just ask is, you from the beginning, yes. when you can share, when please I can, share. I, but when, I absolutely will. I'll try not to fact, keep asking. If you'd like, we can start with this piece over here. Yeah, let's do it. This oh. piece here originated directly from Imagineer Rolly Crump. And this is his hand-painted wooden model for the famous clock of It's a Small World. Because famously, when Mary Blair designed the clock tower, she just drew a flat painting, right? Right, and Rolly took that artwork and turned it into this 3D creation that was used to actually create that clock facade at Disneyland. So he had to figure out how to extrude it and make it 3D. Yes. And there's two, there was a white foam one I remember seeing, like a concept model in Correct. his house. And then this was also from his yeah, house? Yeah, this was directly from Rolly's home um, before he passed. He he had this since 1960s. So, yeah, this was this was Rolly's. So if Rolly got to uh, color it any way he wanted, this is the way Small <laughs> this, World would have turned out. I mean, these numbers are so iconically Rolly Crump and the little hands in there. That's, that's incredible. Even the lettering on like this time is up in the corner. All of that is so classic. Rolly Crump. It looks just Crump. like the uh, Ernie Ball slinky strings Yeah, which was also logo. designed by Rolly. That's amazing. And I can see right away, right here, we have invitations to the opening day of Disneyland. Yeah, that's as early as you can get. That's the opening press preview day for Disneyland. Both the official ticket on the left and the parking pass, which is very hard to find that on the I right. have never ever seen that parking pass. And I think there was a lot of people now who don't have the top tier annual pass who would do a lot to get that parking yeah, you want pass. to see if that would still get you in Yeah, does that still work? Because you know they say like admission tickets will still work. They do, in fact the ones behind you. Oh. These over here, so the, the big story right now is people are realizing that those old ticket books. Right. Some of them, if they're still complete with the main gate admission still attached and if they're unused with no expiration date, they actually still can be redeemed for park admission today. I have a ton of these ticket books and always the admission is ripped off. The yeah, front. so finding ones like these where the admission is still intact is very, very rare. So people, that they used them, they got into yeah, the park. But that tells you that these are at least worth the cost of exactly, an admission worth at least, ticket today, <laughs> yes, exactly. which is not uh, insubstantial. No. So, so these are very, 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 very rare things. What's the oldest one? I see a press pass, 1955. Yeah, so you see that stamp shaking, on, the I'm date nervous. on there, August 18th, 1955. Oh, that's when that was my issued. Gosh. So that's when they're still trying to get press, they're trying to get coverage. Well, yeah, I mean, the park opened July 17th. So that's that's so new that's that incredible. they still needed coverage and they needed promotion. It's such an early... Now, know, we're, I know we're jumping around like crazy, but let's come back over here. Sure. This is obviously a cast member uniform in here. And then what are these little pieces in front of it? So Some of the collectibles? This, yeah, this cabinet is, is a mix of collectibles, props, and other sort of treasures. Like this up here is uh, Casey Jr. from... Um, well, from Casey Jr. Yeah, from Casey, from Casey Jr. <laughs> well, it's not, it's not the ride. And he's from Dumbo. It's from it's it's an animator's maquette from Dumbo. Really? So yeah. that's from creating so that's the an film? actual filming maquette. So that's a piece maquette. of Disney Studios history. That's a piece history. of Disney Studios history. Famously yeah. a plagued production because of the strike. Yes, exactly. This was probably the bane of Walt's existence, that film at the time. And then here we have some merchandise that's, I can never pronounce the name of the people that <laughs> yeah. made these models. Ol Olchevsky. Olchevsky. Uh, yeah. Robert Olchevsky, famous famous miniaturist. Well, I just learned something. And then what about this uh, Jiminy Cricket so maquette? That's a, yeah, that's a Jiminy Cricket maquette from Pinocchio's Daring Journey. So that's uh, from creating right. the ride. That's from creating the ride. Whoa. And then to the left of that, you'll this see- This way! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you'll see a uh, employee award. That's a 30-year service award. Wow. You'll see below that, it says Wed Mapo Imagineering Service And then how award. about this big crest underneath? So that decorated one of the uh, light fixtures at Disneyland during one of their anniversary years. That's crazy. Okay, and then this is the reason why I wanted to pull you to this cabinet, though, is ulterior motives, because I really wanted to get to something that I care about a lot more, which is this dog here and this giant thing over here. Pan up on that, Tyler. 
This is a recognizable face. Where the heck did these pieces come from? These are a few of the pieces, including this devil up above you here. What oh, they call I the, didn't even the cow him. devil. Uh, these are props from Mr. Toad's wild ride at Walt Disney World. Uh, you know, famously bygone attraction there. Yeah, the one I never got to ride. I got there a little too late, Corey. This one here is one of two that were on either side of the fireplace. So these are the andirons. And you see the uh, the glow of the fire kind what of are, illuminating the uh, left side there. What are these made out of? Can I touch it? Is that okay? It's it's metal. You can Probably touch the back touch there. Probably shouldn't touch it. I'll touch the yeah. back of it. Oh, but yeah, it's it is paint, metal. Painted metal. Because I always wonder when you go through, are they just plywood? Yeah, sometimes I mean, they're plywood, sometimes they're metal. I guess it depends on exactly where they're being installed. And then this dog and here. That, yeah, that dog also hand-painted. I believe that one's board rather than metal. Yeah, he looks like some kind of masonite maybe or something. That is incredible. And we even see we even have the reference manual for Disney World's Mr. Toad next to it there. And that's from the same ride these pieces are from. What's incredible about it is when you go through those dark rides and they're lit up with the black light and everything, it really looks like... These are 3D objects yeah, they do. a lot of times. It's amazing what they can do to trick, trick the eye as you're going through. So these are a lot of stu studio animators and artists, I would imagine, were probably involved in yeah. the painting of stuff exactly. like this. That's incredible. How often does stuff like this come through the doors at Heritage You know, auctions? we do one large Disney theme park auction a year, and we really kind of pull the best of the best together all year round. Because you guys do historical you. documents. Yeah, everything. You do movie props. Comic books, oh. entertainment props, any, anything. Well, what about the Scrooge McDuck? Okay, now, wait, hold on for a second. What did you call this devil? They, so internally, like Imagineering, they call them cow devils. That just that's the popped official, into my that's mind. The official term. Cow devils, cow really? Devil. Yeah. I never knew that. So there's a new Disneyland fact for all those there Disneyland nerds. Internally in the company, they call it a cow devil. Hashtag cow devil. Real quick, what about this figment? So yeah, figment I love there. Figment. One of the most iconic characters, fan favorite figment. Uh, that was taken directly off of the actual figure used in Journey into Imagination with Figment. Wow, the original one, huh? The original, yes. Oh my gosh, okay. Now I can ask about the Scrooge McHedge over here because I'm a big fan of Scrooge McDuck and if people out there haven't read the Carl Barks comics or the Don Rosa comics, you should really get to it. Scrooge McDuck famously inspired George Lucas, Steven Spielberg with Indiana Jones and all kinds of, there's all kinds of film connections and people I, don't I know. I believe Scrooge is still the most wealthy fictitious character of all time. Probably. With that, with that famous money pit. So is this a, a filming maquette? or what is this So that's actually from? a first generation big fig. The famous big figs we have a few we'll see big throughout the day figs. here. Big uh, figs. That was one of the first big figs created with Who Scrooge McDuck. Who made those? Disney, it was for different purposes. The Disney catalogs had some. Disney <sighs> theme parks had their own. So depending on where they were being offered, they had different I versions. keep seeing things like that. And they're like, they're big figs. They were for sale yeah. back in the day. You could have owned one. Um, and I'm like, why? Why did I there? miss out? OK, but, the, look, but even like this Goofy there's here. There's so much stuff. This it's, equestrian Goofy is another big fig. Very much more complicated uh, design of that one. What about Abu over here? Abu is a Disney store character. OK, so, so there's, a, one of the there's a whole mix. There's a lot of collectibles in here, which I like that. That that really gets me excited. What about this, this wed? Yeah, another really popular category of Disneyland collecting is the documentation. So things like this, where you see internal produced material, and see wet Imagineering in the corner there. Summer of 1967, Tomorrowland. Oh this gosh. gives you some of the earliest information on that, what I consider the best era of Tomorrowland. Yeah, 1968. Yeah. When they opened new, the new Tomorrowland that Walt exactly. didn't live to see, but that is the last kind of, it's sort of almost the last sort of Walt approved big yeah. land or expansion. Okay, so there's so much here. I can't, I can't, I want to ask stop. about everything, but why don't you just show us sure. like, well, the cream of the few, crop? A few Otherwise, highlights here. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see down in this corner one of my favorite items in this sale. Uh, this is from the Walt Disney World Mill Shop. You can see it carved into the metal there. Oh this is surveying equipment from Florida when they were surveying for building Walt Disney World ahead of 1971. Whoa. I know I said I was going to try not to ask this, but does a piece like this come from? The person who worked on the project? Does it come from someone found it in a dumpster? I mean, how? That's every, so crazy. Every piece has a different story. I'll share wh where I can, but it, it really does come from a little bit of everything. It comes from people who worked there at the time and, and got to keep something. It comes from collectors. It's Disney famously used to sell certain props, certain right. art, which we'll get to a few in a second, that come with Disney COAs for some of these artifacts. Sell so more everything, stuff, Disney. Everything has a different story, but some of them from like Because that's an incredible piece, yeah. and I got to imagine that if I had had that, I would have wanted to pass it right. to my kids exactly. or something like that. But I recognize this right away because my friend Leroy Schmaltz carved all the originals of these, the master patterns for these. That's a piece of oceanic arts history right there. But where did this one come from parks-wise? Yeah, so this is a Disneyland Adventureland uh, sculpture. 
Um, the earliest ones, and up, even up to somewhat recently, but the newer ones, you know, they sort of reproduced them. Yeah. This is carved wood, so it's one of the older ones. Um, but even then, it was probably still circa 80s, 90s. And you know but, what? They had several like this that you could buy off the shelf at mm. Oceanic Arts, but these large ones like this, Leroy usually hand carved for Disneyland. And then if you want to look through this shelf here, we have quite a few Adventureland artifacts, <gasps> things from the, the Jungle piranha. Cruise. Oh, yeah, one of the famous. The, the, the display was built, but the piranha is the prop. So you that's know, from the jump out of the water, exactly. Oh my gosh! You can see that bracket where it would be attached to the rod that would switch Spit it out of the water. Spit him around. What about yeah. this hand here next to it? That's Indiana Jones Adventure. That's one of Indiana Jones's hands. No kidding! Yeah. You can see it's actually if you zoom in at the bottom of the uh, the wrist there, it'll say I J carved into the. No way! That is so cool. Okay, now that we got the Jungle Cruise. Uh, the Jungle River Cruise reference manual right next door to that there from Disney from World. Disney World, and you now, actually see a uh, Hondo Hattie Jungle Cruise sign below that. So is the reference manual, is that like ride operations, or does that have the, the spiel and the script in there? So we actually, in this sale, we do have one of the documents that goes over the, the jokes and the spiel. For really? This. Yeah, we have that backstage. Um, I believe this is more just reference of different elements of the attraction rather than the script. Okay, now one of the rarest things in here has to be these little metal cutouts. And Tyler, you can come look at like the skull one up here, or down here there's a couple of animals. And that is from? Yeah, that's the shooting arcade, the big game shoot in Adventureland. You'll see a few of the targets. You see the skull up here. You have a crab and a rhino. Down here you have a baboon and a panther. Oh, I didn't even notice those. And most people will not know what this is. So in Adventureland in the 60s, there was a shooting arcade in there, like an actual like pellet gun firing shooting arcade. Famously, they'd have to repaint these, you know, when they got oh, so these up were too painted. Much. Sometimes they were painted, yes. Wow! So these are the actual metal targets. Now I've got photos of like the sign, the big game shoot. And yes, you can find them on the target, Dave yeah. Land and exactly. things like that. But to actually see the targets, I don't know that I've ever seen a picture of inside of the actual shooting gallery. No, have and you? that's such an iconic early era Disneyland attraction because it was an attraction you, you know, yeah you know and something they would never do today the no, big game shoot today. come in and pretend to hunt some big game animals <laughs> yes. kids that'll be fun that is incredible and these are in the auction so when is the actual auction uh, happening? yeah the auction takes place april 5th through 8th it's a four-day sale 2024 if you're watching this later when, when you have 1800 items you have to do it across a few different days and is there like a do people come here and bid? If, if they want to come, they can come. It's a live sale. But However, happens most online people also, do right? bid online. So okay. you can view everything on HA for Heritage Auctions. HA.com, that's it. HA.com. That's it. That's a get, getting that yeah, address. That, that's, an that's, early, a get. that's an early grab. Okay, so now speaking of Jungle Cruise, tell us about this. So this is one of the original uh, ticket coupon uh, collecting <laughs> devices. Uh, so Jungle Cruise famously an early e-coupon attraction. Uh, you could collect the e-coupons for admission to the attraction and dump them in the... So those are the tickets here. that are in these ticket books over here that we saw earlier and everybody calls them ticket books and everybody says an e-ticket attraction yes. but they do say in the books coupon. E coupon. That's right. I love that Corey is so professional. He's got he's got the tie, he's got it down, he said coupon. coupon. That's a big deal. So, <laughs> so somebody restored this one, right? Yes, this has been uh, repainted. Um, as you can imagine, wow. you know, quite a quite a lot of life out of this uh, but device But this is where here. you'd go, and I, uh, presumably there'd be a cast, cast member, member next to it. Yes, standing exactly. next to this. They'd take your ticket and they'd just drop it in here. Yeah. But I've never, you, you were saying earlier that you've seen another one of these. Yes, we had a few years back, we had the Haunted Mansion. Okay, so, they, um, so they're out there. This is the only second one I've ever seen. Yeah, so, I've, I've never seen one. The things relating to the early ticket books, the early ride coupons, are really hard to come by. That's incredible. And that's such a popular area of collecting. It's weird that it was an e-ticket e -ticket attraction yes. because um, when I, I collect old Disneyland footage and when I watch all this old, super, you know, not, uh, what am I thinking of? Home video footage, basically, mm. from back then film. Everybody filmed the Jungle Cruise. Yeah. Like, it was a big standout attraction. Now it's like day. a background attraction. All oh, that old Jungle Cruise. It, it still gets some enjoyment. You see, people, you see lines around the block. People right? went nuts for the Jungle yeah. Cruise back then. They'd never seen anything like that. Look, a hippo! My lord! You know. Yeah. Not literally my lord, like they were worshipping the hippo. Yes. But like they were excited <laughs> to see the hippo. Okay, right. what is this guy up here? This is, uh, some may remember from Walt Disney World, there was the Barker Bird outside Pirates of the Caribbean that would yeah. beckon people to come inside and enjoy the 
pirate adventure that awaited them. However, uh, Kevin Kidney and Jody Daly, Disney artists, uh, created this masterful replica of Peg Leg Pete the Barker Bird using the original molds for the actual prop. Wow. So this is as close as you can get to the actual prop. They make so many incredible, yeah, Kevin and Jody weird one-off things that I never heard about at the time, and then years later, you're like, where was I to get one but of they those? Even, they even hand-stitched the hat there. I mean, everything about this is so masterfully done. I mean, even the incredible. insertion of the feathers, the little plucked feathers on his chest. And speaking of pirates, I can see here we've got a pirate head down here. Is that the actual skin that goes yeah, over, or is this a mold? That is the, I think they call hot melt uh, skin. That's the older method of creating the animatronic skins. Uh, so that's one of the more iconic, recognizable characters from Pirates of the Caribbean. Starting from the bottom down there, I know that's, um, what'd you say, those are embers? Those are some of the burning embers, yeah. That's actually <sighs> custom placed in a light box so that from the bottom it lights and the embers can glow. And then above it, this is a piece of a Disneyland pirate cannon? Mm -hmm. That's a section of a cannon from Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland. So weird because you wouldn't think about, you would never think that the cannon would wear out. <laughs> and exactly. need to be replaced or a piece of the can thrown away. Well, when you and think then, that they're actually, what are they actually made out of? They're not, you know. It's yeah, like, it's what are they made out of? A lot of times it's it's foam or it's other kind of composite materials and they do have to be replaced. I guess even if it's metal, things are going to rust in there. Sure. It's a very humid environment in Pirates. Yeah, okay, well, but, imagine, do you want chunks of metal hanging above the boats? Right, and right. So maybe re that something lighter weight. Shouldn't, yeah, <laughs> it probably shouldn't be metal. Okay, but I've all been building all this up because I mainly wanted to ask you about this, because yes. this is the rarest, weirdest, I've never heard of this in my life. Tell us about this character right here. This is a maquette for the character Honest Marooned Pete. So he was a planned character for Pirates of the Caribbean, one of the early planned characters. And he's essentially selling the writers loot that he had from later in the attraction. So as guests would come by, they would there would be Honest Marooned Pete trying to make a buck off of the uh, guests riding through on their boats. but sort of according to legend, Walt Disney uh, saw that character and thought, I don't want any of the living characters mixed in with the dead because Honest Marooned Pete was going to be at the beginning of the attraction so with, all the with all the skeletons. Exactly. Picking, and sort Walt, of grave robbing. And Walt didn't want any living characters with the skeletons. So Honest Marooned Pete was out of there. Walt didn't want a dirty haunted mansion. He wanted <laughs> it to look nice and clean from the outside. He wanted, and apparently he wanted a clean pirate attraction clean too. Pirate attraction. Look, we can pillage, we can plunder, we can rifle, we can loot, but not from the dead. What in the world yeah, is that, that? That hand, you'll even see some of the uh, metal framework sticking out of it. That's from Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland. And I believe that is from the pirate that's dunking Carlos into the well. Really? You'll see if you get an angle on it to the left, you can see the hole that goes through where that rope could stick through. Oh yeah, you can see where the rope goes through his hand. Now what's up with those fingers though, bro? Those are some weird fingers, Corey. Do you, you expect a perfectly of... manicured pirate? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> He's a dirty guy. Okay, and then down here, speaking of dead pirates, is this from Pirates of the yeah, Caribbean? Every, every skeleton piece, every coin and, and no bit of pirate way. treasure, every, everything in there is from the attraction. Now there's of course the whole urban legend that in the very earliest days of pirates, it was supposedly cheaper to get real human bones than it was to make fake human bones. So, are any of these? Well, why don't we? Why don't we keep that to urban legend? Oh, you know what's funny? Everyone I've ever talked to that would would know mm -hmm. in the parks, that's worked in the parks, or done maintenance in the parks, or had to deal with the skeletons, they'll say the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. We can either confirm nor deny whether or not. Get a close I think up it's, on this. It's Tyler. more fun to, to not know. It kind of is. They, you know, there's the rumor that the one skull is still a real human skull, and I now know the truth behind it. But well, I don't want to reveal you it. You want to reveal it? No, because it's such a great urban legend. I wanted the legend to live forever. Well, you know what happened to the last guy that revealed it? Oh, yeah. He, he became the he next skull. He was the skull. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And Tyler's going to have to back way, way up and walk back. That's the best thing about Tyler. Look at this. <laughs> We're getting entertained watching him right. walk backwards because would you look at the size? Of this stuff in here. This is where the big boy toys are, That's Corey. Right. I know Some, what we're looking something at. Something for everybody. This is an original Autopia Mark vehicle 7. body. Mark 7. Oh. And it's made of fiberglass, painted fiberglass. Uh, famously, when they retired the Mark 7s, they took off the fiberglass bodies and replaced them with the new model. Right, the new Honda. Exactly. Uh, were they Honda from the beginning? I think it was, like a crossover with Honda. That, that was the 1998 Tomorrowland. Yes, exactly. I think Autopia took until 2000 or something. Was it 99? Yeah, something like that. It was a little after the rest of the yeah. land. But So these were the ones I grew up That's with it. in so my many childhood. 
wrote on these exact Autopia. And they're still cars. using these in Florida, I think, the Mark 7, the basic Mark 7 sort of shell design, but right. this is a Disneyland one, right? as far as one, right? Disneyland, California, this is as you know iconic of Autopia as you can get. Oh my gosh, this still says, it's very, 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 very hard to see. But it still says, do not bump the car ahead of you on there. Like that is still the same warning plaque from when I was little. That is so cool. And I could smell this car. When I see this, I instantly smell that kind of diesel-y. That would uh, result in the cast members getting a little extra money yeah. per, per hour. Due Did to they? Fumes. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Because this, this is like, this is everything. This, I want to get in and we should drive this, Corey. Come on. Are there wheels? <laughs> if you want to get a go-kart, we can... Uh... Rats. This was famously, though, designed by Bob Gurr. Designed by Bob Gurr, who he, actually, it's hard to see, but he signed it up there. Oh, did he? he a very, for the distinguished eye, you can make out the Bob Gurr signature on the top. Bob signs everything. Yeah. And, uh, and he designed the original one. I don't think he designed Mark III or four. There were some, there were some non-Bob bodies mm -hmm. that came in through the years, but I know he designed the Mark VII, and it was the longest lasting. And famously, if Bob likes to say, if there's wheels on it at Disneyland, Bob Gurr designed Bob Gurr it. Designed it. One thing yeah. he didn't design, though, is this. I've actually seen this before, and I can't say where or when I've seen this before, but you got to tell us what this is, because most people aren't going to know what this is, but this is a super legendary piece of Disneyland yeah, history. This, this is an actual door from the Chicken of the Sea pirate ship restaurant in Fantasyland, which famously was destroyed somewhat on accident when they were trying to yeah. relocate it in the new Fantasyland. Uh, but this is, you know, 1955, Chicken of the Sea Fantasyland. It was one of the most used images for early Disneyland. It was on postcards, yeah. it was on souvenirs, it was this everywhere. It was a giant pirate, the pirate ship that you ship. see in Fantasyland. And you can go get your Chicken of the Sea tuna burger in Fantasyland. And I've done a couple videos about it because I'm obsessed with the idea that you went to Fantasyland and the yeah. big attraction is this big pirate ship and you get in and what do you get? A tuna, tuna sandwich. Tuna sandwich. I mean, that is fantastic. So this is the door from where? The downstairs door when you enter or it's the, the upstairs entrance, door? It's the entrance door. This is the one this downstairs. The one. So after a while they, they plus that area and they kind of turned it into sort of a Neverland Lagoon and there was Skull Rock over there. And I know it had a little wooden walkway that led to the base of that door. And there was actually a live parrot that they had for a while out mm -hmm. there. So this is like, this is a legendary piece of so many people's childhoods that are yeah. obviously older than me. Sure. Because I was born but. in 1983 and that was the year New Fantasyland opened. Exactly. And so the story is, and you can tell me if you know more, yeah. Go ahead. That in 1981 or two, when they were knocking down old Fantasyland, mm -hmm. they were going to try to relocate the pirate ship or use pieces of it somewhere else, and it was just yeah, falling apart. The water got to it. Oh. The fact that the, the base layer of it was so heavy, it just ripped it apart when they were trying to move it. So it's dry around it. Now, people yeah. always say, there's still these urban legends that, oh, there's pieces of it, that the yeah. Chicken of the Sea pirate ship is actually inside Peter Pan. It's in the dark ride, and that's the ship Everything in there. but the door. Yeah, but it's, uh, I don't, I don't yeah. buy it. <laughs> I don't buy it, Corey. This one here is a Disney World monorail door. That's you'll Mark that, IV. You'll see, and you'll see the contemporary logo on there too. This one's been restored. It's been you know used and enjoyed, so it was brought back to its original vibrance, but all the components are authentic and original. And just so everybody knows, this is from the original monorail lime launched in 1982. That was later part of the Las Vegas monorail. Yep. I Go think. watch Justin's video. So on this is from monorail. that monorail, and you can get a piece of you can now get a piece of that legendary monorail here. That's right. But here's an even I hate to say this here's an even more legendary monorail piece. Yeah, I've I've never seen a component like this. This is what we call the captain's door from the monorail at Disneyland, the Mark III monorail. And this is monorail gold, <sighs> and you'll see that like the riveting pattern. The, it's met, you can look on the other side as well if you like to get a view of the back end but to have a, a full door from the monorail i've just i've never even, never it even is heard insane of another one insane because this is obviously just a car door handle and so the way that they were like kind of kit bashing and yeah. using these pieces to create it so this is another famous bob Gurr design obviously and actually this is the last monorail he designed was the mark IV mm. that he personally the learjet version and this is obviously based on the earliest monorails he designed yeah monorail gold is like, I mean, over the years, a few of the panels have come up, but I've never seen, like, especially you, from such an early. You've been doing this for a while. Yeah. So how long have you been in? Uh, ten. The, I've been doing this for ten years. Of uh, as long as I've Disney known you. Disney theme park auctions. Yeah, we know each other. So you've seen duration. a lot of 
pieces of history come through the door, and this is a very rare. Yeah, I've, I've never seen another one of these. Signage is one of the more popular areas to collect because it's just so easy to put up and yeah, enjoy. Yeah, easy to put on the wall. But look at this. Due to the grand opening dedication for Splash Mountain, Big Thunder Mountain opens at 9.30. This is the genesis of Splash Mountain. I mean, that is the coolest, most epic thing. Not only is it the origin of Splash Mountain, but if, if you get two attractions for the price of one on there. Yeah, because you <laughs> get Splash both on the signs. So this is crazy because I, I feel like, you know, as Splash Mountain was closing and around a little bit of controversy, but for people of a certain age, especially yeah. right at my age or even your age, but I remember when Splash Mountain opened, sure. so it was a big new attraction for right. me. So I'm very nostalgic for it because it was the cool new thing when I first got to well, ride it. Disney's never, I mean, Song of the South, Disney's never released that right. for home video or any, anything. So those characters, most people know them now from, from Splash, Splash Mountain. Mountain. And speaking of which, let's not overlook this one over here. Oh, yeah. Probably a good time to talk about Splash Mountain. Oh! So this is a very popular Charles Boyer uh, uh, I can't artwork. believe we walked right by but this. These are actual leaves from Splash Mountain no. in there with that print. From the interior of it? Yeah, you'll see these hanging overhead within the attraction. No or, you way. So these are actually what they're made out of? There weren't real leaves, Corey? Are you they, kidding me? They weren't. Just some Disney magic there. That's incredible. And then, Justin, you're going to recognize this piece here. I am speechless because I feel like I was just at Disneyland five minutes ago filming this piece. So this has just come out of the park. So this is from the Briar Patch. You're correct. This is hand carved, hand painted, wooden sign from the Briar Patch next to Splash Mountain at Disneyland. Is Heritage Auctions actually stretching, Corey? Or is it my imagination? Well, it's not your imagination, Justin. This is an actual stretching portrait prop from Disneyland. This is a hand painted very, very large. You want to stand next to that. Yeah, that look comparison. at the size of this thing, dude. This, I'm massive. six feet tall, so look at how huge that is. I mean, Haunted Mansion, easily one of the most fan-favorite popular attractions of the parks. Uh, instantly recognizable. This is one not only a prop from the ride, but it's also mentioned in the narration. It's a critical prop from the ride. And the earliest, earliest stretching portraits were hand-painted, just like this one. But the, the modern ones used now are printed. So this so is hand painted? This is hand painted on canvas. Whoa. I, it's like a freeway sign. You never know how big they are until you actually get to stand exactly, next to yeah. one. I never realized they were this huge. So what, what about this? Is this an actual Haunted Mansion yeah, cast member jacket? Actual cast member jacket <sighs> from the Haunted Mansion. That famous green color. Uh, those are the tail coats that, that they would wear. So cool. This is where their name badge would go. For my money, one of the coolest things in here so far. Yes. Because I remember looking at this, and if you guys don't recognize this on the camera, you're probably a little younger than me, and you're probably a little more used to finding Nemo, but this is from the submarine attraction at Disneyland, right? Yeah, this is the diver prop that you could see looking out your porthole window as you went through the original iteration of the submarine voyage at Disneyland. This is one of those props we were talking about that was actually sold by Disney. This is really? the COA right here that no Disney offered with way. that piece in 2005. So Disney sold this themselves. They auctioned it Correct. off somewhere? They auctioned it off. It was sold by Disney. It comes with that COA. Wow. They actually mentioned on the COA that any and all replicas have been destroyed. Wow, so all the molds, any kind of thing like that. This is a one-of-a-kind piece. And this is from the... Now, I remember seeing a different auction where they had the giant sea serpent. Yes. Next to that, this might be the most standout thing from that ride to me. Sure. I mean, this was a part of the attraction that was mentioned by the, you know, the captain's narration. Yeah. He would mention the, the salvage uh, operation going on outside your window and you could look down and see these very divers oh gosh. fighting over their treasure chest, trying to get it. But now as a kid, I thought they were full size. I thought they were real people yeah. in there, you know? And I can see now there's all these hoses down here and I don't know if you'll be able to see them, Tyler, but there's all these hoses down here that look pneumatic, like air would have exactly. powered this. And that would have caused a little bit of movement to shuffle, just to give that extra little illusion of life. So it's basically like, just like your fish tank props, but blown up full scale. And then this isn't the only piece of the submarine voyage that you have in here, because I can see all the walls are covered <laughs> Correct. with submarine so stuff. So this is actual coral section from the submarine voyage. You have here a seat from the attractions, you would sit on that as you look out your porthole window. So this window. is like original, before the refurbishment, the old school seats and for then your And next to that, these purple sections are coral sections from the, the newer iteration, the Nemo version of the submarine So that's voyage. Nemo coral. 
That's but crazy. The reason I think these divers are so spectacular and all these props from Submarine Voyage, I mean, that's, I mean, an, a Walt era Disneyland attraction. Okay, so as you are gathering, there is a lot of stuff in here. Like, not only is there a lot of stuff in here, there's even more stuff in the auction than is even in this room, from what I'm told. But there's a back room we've got to get to, too. And Corey is waiting for us with some more epic stuff from the parks, some more epic Disney collectibles. Look at this thing right here. So full animatronics like this, you, you never get these. This is the, the highlight of any Disney collection would be full a Disney full animatronic from an attraction. Yes, this is from Food Rocks. This is one of the junk food band members, The Excess. And that was the Kitchen Cabaret show at Epcot in The Land. So Disneyland fans are going to go, I don't remember this guy, but for right. kids that grew up going to Disney World, this was like legendary. You can see the mechanics still attached. So you can manipulate the eyes oh back and forth. Gosh. You can manipulate the mouth up and down. Does he still rock? <laughs> Okay, and then what's in the display case next door? There are a few things in this case that are really special. Two of which are these attraction poster, original concept designs. So this was a planned poster for the Chicken Plantation Restaurant in Frontierland. Oh my god. That poster gosh. never got made, so that's as close as you can get to the Oh, so they poster. never made this they poster? They never made the final poster for that. No But way. one that they did make the final poster for is this one, Casa de Fritos, which is arguably the hardest attraction poster to get your hands on. I've never seen one in real life. Have I mean, you guys I think I know seen of, one? I think I know of two. That exist? That exist. Wow. And it's the, everyone that has an attraction poster collection, they're after Casa de Fritos. So if people don't know what Casa de Fritos is, it, it started actually over basically kind of where River Bell Terrace is now and then moved over next to Big Thunder. And that is where they invented the Dorito. That's right. So Fritos sponsored this restaurant in there, and mm -hmm. it was the little scraps of tortilla. Someone went, oh, my grandma fries those. Yeah. And they invented the Dorito, which is obviously Frito still owns, not Disneyland. Thank you, Disneyland. But that's where the Dorito was born, right in that right restaurant. And this is the concept artwork. So to have not just one of the rarest and hardest to find posters, but the actual art for that poster is unheard of. Right? And it's so tiny. It's like such a little piece but it's such a big piece of history. Okay, so now we're about to walk into the world of Mark and Alice Davis. Both of them worked for Imagineering, but they also both worked on Disney films, and Mark Davis especially worked on early Disney animated films, starting all the way back with Snow White, yeah, right? Yeah, if you start over here, we can see some of Mark's earliest work. Oh, this is amazing. Disney. So this case features a lot of early Mark Davis artifacts from this Disney studio period. Uh, you'll see there that photo of so many iconic Disney animators, artists, and individuals. You see their names above. Herb Ryman, Ken O'Brien, Mark Davis, AC Exitensio, Mary Blair's there in the center. I mean, what a, what a photo. He was and one of the nine old men, right? Mark so, I was mean... famously one of the nine old men. And actually, you'll see, uh, when we get to it, uh, we have Mark Davis's Disney Legends Award coming up. He was honored as a Disney legend with the other eight of the Nine Old Men. That's amazing. So he's one of Walt's go-to guys, basically. One of the go-tos. And he started with Snow White, and look so, what's in that case. Speaking of Snow White, we have a few artifacts here. This is Mark's personal reference binder of drawings from Snow White. And you have drawings in there of Snow White, you have drawings of the old hag, you have drawings of the dwarves. There's over a hundred drawings in here utilized in the making of Snow White, straight from Mark Davis's personal collection. And this book is for sale. It's, it's for sale. In this auction. You can bid on it right now. You can own Mark Davis's sketchbook full of Snow White drawings. And this is from the production. Yeah, that is a piece of animation and, in general, oh film history. That's the gosh. first feature-length animated film ever made. And I see he's got an award here. He's got That's a one Mark of, Davis yeah, award. Yeah, this isn't a Mouseker award. This was the internal uh, sort of mouse and Oscar. Right. Mouseker. And that was the internal award given for distinguished, you know, employees. And but then on the stories. other side of the book, what? are we looking at because that is weird. That is Mark Davis's hand sculpted maquette for Snow White used in the creation of the film. So this is his own sculpted out of clay reference for her head shape, her face. So maquettes are utilized by animators to sort of get a 3D rendering of the characters that'll help them drawing it in 2D. If you look at the drawings here, sort of conceptualizing how a 3D character would appear in this drawing can be challenging. So having a maquette where you can turn it, you can look at the different angles is very helpful as an artist tool. But Mark sculpted that himself for use in Snow White. And then a little lower than the Snow White items, 
you'll see pieces like cells, original animation cells from Pinocchio, and you'll see Jiminy Cricket over there on the right. You'll see some drawings, you'll see things like his employment contracts down below there. I mean, there's a little bit of everything. This auction is incredible because it represents so much of Mark's life, both his work at the studio, the theme park, and his personal artistry. Oh, that is incredible. That is, that looks like Cinderella over here. I know Walt Disney, I think, once famously said that one of his favorite pieces of animation that he'd ever done is Cinderella's transformation into her dress, and that, I think, was animated by Mark Davis. I think that was all his art, right? And I like how when, you, when they circle things like that, usually they're working on designs or working on poses, and that's showing, okay, there's, that's, that's, that's the, the design that's we it. like. That's the one we want. And then you said something earlier about this Mickey Mouse Deadline magazine. What yeah, that is, is that? I've never heard of that. 1937. That is volume one, number one of Mickey Mouse Deadline. That is the studio internal publication. And you see right there at the bottom, it says January 1937. That's the very first studio publication, the first issue. That, that alone, just that alone is in like an insane piece of yes. Disney Studio history. Every case, every piece in here is something amazing. I'm really treasure. struggling for words. I'm glad that you so, are kind of used to this stuff because <laughs> I can't think. I don't right think you here. ever really get used to it. Everything is, is so unique. I mean, like these here, those are early Charlotte Clark dolls of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. Those are from the collection of Mark and Alice Davis. Just to have something like that is rare on its own, but to know it comes from the collection of two Disney legends is every it's amazing. So this was their stuff. Yeah, these are Mark and Alice's uh, brushes, pens, pencils, uh, rulers, and other. You see Mark's name on that one there. Uh, these are Mark's sketchbooks. Even if you look to the right, you know the, how much how much time and work he went into practicing so that he could do the things that he's done. And, I mean, this uh, is incredible. This is like a, a real look inside of how the classic Disney films were made, which. You know, not to poo-poo what they're doing now because it takes, obviously, a, all kinds of skill and artistry and things like that. But it's very different from the old days where everything had to be done by hand. You had to practice everything by hand, every exactly. pen stroke, every brush stroke. And from what I understand, Alice met Mark when he was her teacher at a Schoenart Institute, That's like correct. an art class. And then it, uh, he had her working on Disney films, and then later Walt met them out at dinner or something like that. I was like, what does she do? And brought her into the fold as well. So this couple worked together for Disney for how long? 50, more than 50 years. Yeah, very long. Because Mark started at the studio side and then transitioned into Imagineering. And Alice worked on Imagineering as well. And even he went to work on Disney parks in Florida. And, other, and he worked as a consultant even on other Disney parks. So yeah, Mark worked with Disney for a very long time. I see here like their, their personal Christmas cards, but the thing, I don't know why, but when you open this case and yeah, I caught the a smell, smell of the, the, uh, the pencils and the brushes, yeah, the I graphite. mean, that really brings it home. So many, many uh, fans of Disney animation are fans of Mary Blair and her work so iconic. So iconic of yeah. uh, the early uh, animations. So. These are original Mary Blair paintings that she had gifted to Mark and Alice Davis that oh hung in their home. Oh my gosh. And there's actually a note on the back of this one I'll, sh I'll show you. So she gifted them the Watermelon Boy, and then afterwards, she Ooh. gifted them this one. <laughs> if you want to read the little note on here. Dear Mark and Alice, this little gal was missing her Watermelon Boyfriend. They belong together. I send her with love and gratitude for many happy times, there will be more. Mary. Isn't that special? So both of these hung in their home. I mean, Dude. They, especially, especially Alice Davis, they were so close with Mary. That had Mary Blair's address on the back of it, on Mary Blair stationery. Who knew Mary Blair had her own stationery? First of all, look at that great photo of him in the studio on his little, <laughs> on his little bike with, with the, with the uh, cigarette in his mouth. That's very old school Disney. And then look at all these name badges. This is insane, Corey. So all of these are in the auction. Are they individually in the that's, auction? That's they one lot. Set? Wow. That's one grouping. So somebody could get all of Mark Davis's Disney badges. And then what's up with the, uh, with the helmet here? What is that? So that's, his, that's Mark Davis's Wed Imagineering hard hat. And it's got his hand-painted Wed logo and hand-painted name. Mark Davis right across the front. So he would have worn that during, presumably during projects at the parks or something like that? Exactly. That's amazing. 
But you can see that photo up above it. That's Alice working on the, the redhead costume for the Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh my gosh. And then there's a famous story that just before Walt died, one of the last things he did, because they were working on pirates at the time he passed away, was to go over and see Alice and see her. Uh, she had just finished the auctioneer costume, so that's the sort of famous legend. And so she's one of the last people to see Walt Disney alive and at work, which is really crazy to think about. All right, obviously there's a lot here. How many pieces just from their side, do you know offhand? There are about 600 items just from the Mark just and Alice Mark archives. And, oh yeah. my gosh, so there's way too much art here for us to film every piece or, right. or really digest every piece. But continuing with the, the park stuff, there's some really amazing stuff over here. Sure, we why don't we love you to show us. Let's take a look at some of Mark's sketches. So if you look at these shelves here, this is just a small sampling of what's in the auction. Again, everything you can go view online right now on HA.com, but you'll see Mark's concepts for bears of the Country Bear Jamboree up there. Uh, below that, you'll see a concept sketch of environment and pirates from Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, to the left, you'll see sketches of gags for the Enchanted Tiki Room. I mean, these, the are, drummers. these are the Tiki Room yeah. drummers, but that's like them banging yeah, on each yes, other's exactly. heads as a drum. That's something that didn't make it in the ride. But that's an incredible, or in the attraction, I should say, but that's an incredible piece. What about yeah. this down here? And you'll see things from, uh, like, in the center there, from the Jungle Cruise. There's a gag there of the, the gorilla smashing the uh, crocodile head into the water. And then on the right of that, you'll see additional Tiki Room uh, sketches for different sculptures utilized in the attraction. This is really crazy because I've never seen, you know, Mark Davis drawings of tiki's before, and these are very, 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 very traditional. Obviously, mm -hmm. Rolly Crumb came in and did the ones in the lanai. Yes, and everybody knows about that. It's very famous since Rolly did his book. Right, but um, I, as a, just a tiki person, I just like think this yeah. is so cool. Well, you're not alone. Tiki is such a popular topic. So really, I have the combination of Disney and tiki. Coming it's like from a Mark Davis, piece. it's a knockout piece. Like this is, I will be bidding on this. Again, nobody bid on that, it's mine. This though, is really crazy because from what I understand, one of the earliest things he got sort of sucked into doing at the parks was a, the first revamp of the Jungle Cruise right. because originally the Jungle Cruise wasn't very funny and they wanted to plus it yeah. and make it funny and Mark Davis was one of the people that they turned to to go, can you? And you can see that in all of Mark's drawings. He loves examining jokes and character Visual and there's so gags. much life. And he's like, I mean, you call that that. He, he draws that into everything. There's jokes and humor. That's why, if you look behind you, the stretching Ooh. portrait concepts are so amazing. Is that because, what these are right here? These, you know, these? Mark designed the Haunted Mansion's stretching room portraits, which we saw one of those earlier. These are alternative concepts for the tightrope walker stretching portrait. So you'll see he drew a halfway line through them and was examining other types of gags he could have done below the parasol. Wait holding. a minute. So here she is with the alligator, and that's sort of the final, that's what we got yeah. now. But she could have been, what is this over here? I can't tell See the what clouds that behind that? She's on top of a building, it looks like. Oh. Very okay. high up. Here she's on a bone shaker. She's on an old penny farthing bike. This one looks like she's on kind of a fountain or something, who knows. And this one, she's standing on a chair hiding from a mouse. So this is him working out the idea. Yeah, this and is never before seen alternative concepts for the Haunted Mansion stretching portrait. So he's at work, he's doing this. So this might have been something that you know, I don't know when they were working on Haunted Mansion. They obviously started working on it before Walt passed away, but didn't finish until long Correct. after. Yes. So he could have shown this to Walt. He could have shown this to certainly, certainly the other Imagineers and going, what do you think of this? What do you guys think of this gag or that gag? That is, this is insane. Yeah, these I are mean, really special. People go nuts for Haunted Mansion, so I have and a feeling. We have quite a lot of it. I mean, you know, <sighs> other scenes like the famous corridor of doors with the doors opening and shutting. That's an, a version of what ended up in the attraction. The hallway. And then this, no way. Yeah, that's, that's the organ ghost, another iconic from the ballroom scene, that famous organ ghost. You can see a version of Mark's final concept art on the wall over here, but that's the original sketch, the starting point. So this would be the final kind of painting version of that before they would go off and figure out how to build it. But that was the original sketch? Corey, this is insane. I mean, I and know that people have to draw things, they have to design things. But to actually see a drawing like this or a drawing like the Tiki Room or the, it, the Haunted Mansion concept, you're watching him work through yeah. the ideas. You don't realize how much work goes into creating these attractions until you see it like this. Where you don't even see this in the attraction. This yeah, is just, this is just the work to get to one painting exactly. in one part of the beginning of the attraction. 
And these are these are these guys creating and working out yeah. an attraction that's literally beloved by millions, it tens can, of millions yes. of people, maybe hundreds of millions of people mm -hmm. all across the world. It started right here, and you get to, this is your job. You get to hang out with hey, this stuff. You guys can own it. This is this is something. The reason I like doing this is that anyone who's a fan of these rides, these attractions, or even the artist. I mean, Mark Davis, again, beloved both for his studio work and his theme park work. Uh, you can own a piece of that work. And this starts at a dollar. Every single item starts at a dollar. There's a couple things in here that are quite special. Give us a tour. Why don't we start with this hand here? This is actually the skin from Abraham Lincoln's hand from Disney. The Lincoln. real Abraham? Oh, <laughs> for a second, I thought you meant the real Abraham Lincoln. No, Mark Lincoln. did not skin Abraham Lincoln. Okay, cool. <laughs> you'll see. I'll even flip this over for you to look at. You can see the, the oh, slit here the and then the seam with the zipper for including it on and off the animatronic character. That's amazing. To the left of that, you'll see this note's kind of, kind of special. It's from John Lounsbury, and it was a note he wrote to Walt Disney after his trip to the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair. When he returned, he had seen something at the fair that gave him an idea of what they could do at the theme park. So he wrote this letter to Walt saying, maybe we could incorporate this idea at Disneyland. And then Walt took that and wrote, send this to Mark Davis, and gave it to Mark, and Mark held on to it. So that's Walt's writing that's on That's Walt's there. writing in his classic red. And he spelt Mark's and he name wrong. And he spelled Mark's name wrong. Walt was a busy guy. <laughs> he didn't have time to, to check between C's and K's. He didn't have time for spelling. Okay, and, and then, then behi that Yeah, behind that you'll see, that's Mark's uh, hand-colored brown line design for the standing up effect for Abraham Lincoln's animatronic. That's amazing. You know, at the time, that, that was the the first animatronic character, yeah. that was Lincoln. Especially, how are we going to make him stand up? That moment when he stands up in front of the audience, that, that was groundbreaking for the field of Disney animatronics. I remember reading about people that would just gasp because they thought, yeah. it's an actor. It's, it's alive. It's yeah. amazing. Okay, just a couple more pieces from their collection, but this would have been very special to them. What are these? So these are Mark and Alice's Bronze Disney Legends Awards. I mean, that's one of the highest honors the company can bestow is being an official Disney legend. Now, Mark and Alice were separately inducted into the Disney legend program. Mark was inducted along with the eight other nine old men and a Biworks. You know, really? Disney animator, classic Mickey Mouse, early days animator. And you can see photos in here of Mark receiving his award. You see Alice down there receiving her award. But these were in their home proudly displayed. They built custom shelves to display these in their house. They were so proud of these awards. I love that. And it even comes with the little accessories with it. You can see the, the little pin for the Disney Legends Awards that come with these. And you can see Alice's. Also, that's their little Disney Legend pin yeah. that they could wear around at the park or somewhere. That is amazing. And their name badge down there as well. So this isn't something you can just buy off the shelf. You can't just buy a Disney Legends Award. No. I mean, this is like more rare than an Oscar. I mean, this is something yes. very special. Very few individuals in the history of the Disney Studios have been inducted into the Disney Legends program. Uh, having both Mark and Alice's Disney Legends Awards in this is, you know, unheard of. Are they the only husband and wife team who are inducted as Legends? I actually don't know the answer to that. Yeah, me neither. That's, <laughs> that's a good that's question, a, question for the comments. Great question. Great question for the comments. It's the only one that I know of. Okay, so almost last, but certainly not least, is this painting of a tree. Now at first you're like, cool painting of a tree done by Mark Davis, that would make it an interesting piece to Certainly. own. But this is actually a next level piece. Yeah, this, this is one of Mark Davis's most famous works. Uh, this appeared in the Disneyland television show episode where four artists paint one tree. And you can see here, there's Mark with this painting and the other three artists that were with him for that episode, where all four of them painted the exact same tree but that episode so these showed, are the same tree. This that is the exact painting. same tree, but it shows how different artists can take a different look at the same object and result in different beautiful completely work, different creations, completely yeah. different styles. But this this is Mark's you sign there. This is the one that appears. You see him creating it in that episode. This is this so he's is painting this he's in the painting this, Disneyland yeah. TV show mm -hmm. that was used to sort of promote and build for the so park. In a way, else. this is more than just a painting. This is a prop. I mean, it's from that episode. That's incredible. This is like. Ah, anything from the Walt Disney era, yeah. Disney, is incredible. But something that's sort of screen, not screen used, but screen painted. Yeah, screen painted. Even more than screen used. It's, it was created 
in that episode. And it is actually a beautiful painting, but I love yeah. that he painted it in black and white, probably thinking, well, it's black and white TV. And they even produced a limited edition off of this, but this is to have the original hand painted by Mark well, is amazing. Well, the funny part is he could have done this at work. Obviously, he did this at work sure. for the TV show. And then he could have just chucked it in a bin. They could have left it there for the Disney archives yeah. or whatever. But he liked it so much, he took it home. He took it home. And this is actually his frame as well. They had this displayed next to it in their house. Really? They, you know, just to show this is... This is the painting. This is the original. Okay, and then last but not least, what are we looking at? Because this looks like a Muppet to me. <laughs> right. So it's kind of special to, to show this at the end because this was Mark's retirement gift uh, from the model shop at Wet Imagineering. Now, when, when Mark retired, he mentions this in his book, uh, when he retired, he didn't really want a party or any fanfare or anything like that from the higher-ups. But No gold his, watch. His guys in, in the model shop, took it upon themselves to make him this caricature sculpture. And, you know, this is just so characteristically Mark. They presented this to him. You can see him laughing about it up there in that photo. Uh, this oh, this is when they gave it to him? <laughs> yeah, you see. You see oh, that's pretty funny. I mean, he kept this in his house. He really enjoyed this. But amazingly, they put so much work into this. There's a switch underneath his chair that originally, it was you could flick the switch and smoke would come out of that cigarette at the tip of his uh, cigarette there. <laughs> I love this. Okay, so he's sitting down in a chair. He could puff smoke. He's got a little cocktail here. And then there's a matchbook and a little miniature menu from Alfonso's luncheon room over there in Toluca Lake where they would all go, uh, what do we say? Rehydrate <laughs> during the day. Yes, exactly. Look at that. That's a, incredible. And this is in the auction. That's in the auction. So that was the Mark and Alice Davis, what do we call it, the collection? We call it the Art of Disneyland at Heritage Auctions. Ooh, the Art of Disneyland at Heritage Auctions. So that's the title of the whole That's the title of the sale. Shebang, which and includes the Mark and Alice Davis stuff and then all the stuff from the parks. Correct, it's a mixture of both. Only some of which we've seen. This is just a small fraction. You have to view all of it on ha.com. So you said it's 1,800. 1,800 items. Items, and there's so much, so many more sketches. Drawings from Mark Davis, you have full animatronics, you have props and big figs and like anything. That, that was the tip of the iceberg too, oh, and yeah. the sketches and the posters and the collectibles and the things. I, I'm i actually struggling for words and yeah. actually off camera behind the scenes, we're struggling for just, yeah, it's, it's did we lot. film that? Did we do that? Because there's so much here. How do you guys do this on a daily basis? Catalog all this stuff, take care of this stuff, put yeah. it for auction. It's a labor of love. I mean, we really in, do enjoy bringing people in, getting to show off the work that Mark and Alice did, the, the work that goes into creating these attractions, it's an enjoyable part of the job. And you kind of get to take it from wherever, it's at a bar in someone's attic or some yes. family who loved the stuff and get to see it go to the next home where people exactly. really are gonna treasure that. That's another part of that we really enjoy is that these pieces are gonna go to homes where they're gonna be treasured. Yeah. They're not gonna be you know forgotten about, they're gonna be enjoyed, put on the wall. Or left in a and... closet or thrown exactly. out or something. And, and, and it's a great way to, you know, determine things value for number one, and number two, to put it in the hands of a collector who could probably take care of the item and understands the significance of it. Exactly. Which is really incredible. Corey, I gotta thank you so much for letting us come in here and see all this stuff. One more time, it's on display, open to the public in Beverly Hills. From April 1st to April 5th, you can come in and see it in person. Okay. But you can view every single item online at ha.com. ha.com, you can browse basically the whole catalog. And if anyone's in the Los Angeles area and wants to come to our little cocktail party, oh, the yeah. evening of Wednesday the 3rd from 6 to 9 at our Beverly Hills office. And then the actual auction itself The actual is auction is the April 5th. 5th through 8th. Through the 8th. Yes. And and you can bid online, you can come in person, but most people do bid, bid it's online. It's not a three, if people haven't done auctions before, it's not three days of bidding on the same stuff. No. Each day is different It's a four-day sale from five, six, seven, eight, and it'll go, <laughs> yes, it's a lot of items. It's a lot of stuff. So uh, on HA.com, it'll tell you which items are on which day, and then you can follow along with the items you're interested in. So you just make it account. Hmm? Probably better to make an account early. Don't try and do it while yes. your item's up for bid. Well, with 1,800 items, you're going to have to start early to look through everything. Yeah, and then familiarize yourself with the cat. I mean, this, I've, I mean, very rarely have I bid in auctions, Corey, and I'm telling you, some of the stuff here, I might just uh, take my printed first. Printed catalogs. Ooh, and the printed catalogs, and how the heck do you get one of these? You can order that on ha.com. ha.com. Corey, thank you so much for just, letting us in here. This has been mind-blowing, but I think we've done our duty. I need to go home and sleep well and take a couple and go of look through the catalog. And look through this catalog yeah. and, and pray for more money.
between now and then. All right, guys, HA.com. Thank you very much, Corey Brooks. And then is there like any social media for Heritage Auctions? Yeah, we're on Stuff everything. Like that? They're yeah. on everything. And you can Just probably find search, that. Search Heritage Auctions, you'll find us. At HA.com. All right, thank you so much. Right, thanks thanks so to Fake Tyler. Go home, sleep. <laughs>